Good afternoon, everyone. I love freshmen. They still come to order quickly. Right? <laughs> Don't lose that. Right. Um, my name is Jay Harris. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Education. It's my pleasure to welcome you um, to the third annual, is that right? Third annual uh, Gen Ed lecture uh, for freshmen and only freshmen, except for a few guests who slip in here and there. Um, right. This is an opportunity uh, for the general education program to bring before you some of our most illustrious scholars. Um, and best teachers so that you can get a sampling of um, instruction in gen ed and more generally um, in Harvard College. Right? And in particular this year, I mean, we can say that after basically your first day here, right, after one day here at Harvard College, you will know what Darwin did not know. Right? And that's really quite an accomplishment and you can go from there. Um, <laughs> so we are very, very honored this year to have Hopi Hoekstra with us to deliver the, the gen ed lecture. Hopi is an evolutionary biologist interested in the genetic basis of adaptation and speciation among vertebrates, particularly mice. Her research lab here at Harvard encompasses a range of approaches to these questions, including molecular and developmental techniques, population genetics, field-based research with animals in their natural habitats. She did her undergraduate work at UC Berkeley and completed her PhD as a Howard Hughes pre-doctoral fellow I still have to ask you about that. How do you complete a PhD as a pre... Anyway, um, right, she completed a PhD and at the University of Washington, and since 2007, um, she has been here at Harvard, where she's the Alexander Agassiz Professor of Zoology, Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology, and the Curator of Mammals in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. As you can see, she's one of our slackers around here. <laughs> What else can we have her do? Um, Hobie works closely with undergraduates as one of the three co-instructors in Life Sciences 1B, a course I'm sure many of you will be in in the spring. This is an integrated introduction to the life sciences, genetics, genomics, and evolution. Today, Hopi has generously agreed to talk with us about her research uh, regarding genetic mutations in mice. So Hopi, thank you very much. So um, welcome to Harvard. Um, it's, it's really great to um, be able to um, speak with you, to um, be able to give you your first lecture in the sciences. Um, I'm probably just as nervous as you guys are. Um, so how many of you think you're going to be science concentrators? All right. Not bad, not bad. So I will see you, I will see most of you then uh, in the spring in LS1B, as uh, Dr. Harris uh, mentioned. But today what I want to do um, is tell you a little bit about um, our research, and in particular about what Darwin didn't know. So as an evolutionary biologist, I always like to start by talking about Darwin. And you guys probably remember um, just a few years ago in 2009, there were all these celebrations because it was Darwin's 200th birthday, it was the 150th anniversary of his great book on the origin of species, and we had all these celebrations about everything that Darwin knew and everything that got, he got right. But he actually didn't know, you know, it's a little kept, you know, kept secret, that he didn't know quite everything. And it's not surprising, because remember when Darwin was writing his book during his lifetime, we didn't know anything about DNA, chromosomes, genetics. He knew that traits were inherited, but he didn't know how. So the big thing that Darwin didn't know, the missing link in his theory was how uh, traits were inherited. He knew that offspring looked like parents, but he didn't know how that worked. Okay. And in fact, it's one of the few things that Darwin got wrong. He sort of felt like to complete his theory, he needed to put forth a, a mechanism, but he didn't have any evidence. He knew this, so he put forward a hypothesis that was called pangenesis. And the idea was that your cells would produce these little particles called gemmules. And when you were ready to reproduce, those gemmules would migrate down to your gonads, and those would carry information and be passed on to the next generation. Well, of course, we all know that this is completely incorrect. Darwin knew he didn't have a lot of evidence. And in fact, um, when he wrote about this, he wrote about it very cautiously. And he was part, um, with his half-cousin, Francis Galton, did experiments that actually proved that idea incorrect. Okay? Now, of course, um, we know a lot more, but what I want to do is start by telling you a quick anecdote linking Darwin to that second great discovery, and that is the discovery of DNA. So this was unearthed just um, seven years ago, uh, this anecdote. 
So what you're looking at here is Darwin's last publication. It was published in 1882, just two weeks before he died. I don't expect you to read it, just sort of appreciate it, right? It's called On the Dispersal of Freshwater Bivalves. And really what this is is a report of a freshwater beetle and clamped to its leg is a cockle. Now why this was published in this uh, illustrious journal called Nature, even back in 1882, is, is besides the point. I'm happy to tell you about that later. But what's relevant to the story is how Darwin got his hands on this beetle. Well, it was sent to him by a young shoemaker who was an amateur naturalist who was living in the British Midlands. And his name was Walter Drawbridge Crick. Ah, so he was, oh, <laughs> I should turn off my Skype. Um, he was the uh, grandfather of uh, Francis Crick, who with his friend, colleague, and former Harvard professor, uh, uh, Watson, made the second great discovery that is a three-dimensional structure of DNA. And it's in this genetic text that we find even more evidence to support Darwin's great theory. That is our three billion year existence, the shared um, evolutionary uh, common ancestry of all living things. And then the third thing is, and the subject of what I want to talk about today, that is the mechanistic basis of how organisms evolve, the genetic nuts and bolts of how organisms adapt to their environment. So like Darwin, work in my group is motivated by this. That is, understanding how variation is generated and maintained in natural populations. But thanks to Watson and Crick, we're looking for the answer to these questions in the genetic code. So the big question we're interested in is what is the genetic basis of fitness-related traits? Okay? In other words, what are the precise DNA base pair changes that give rise to changes in the way organisms look or act or behave um, that make them produce more offspring or survive better. Okay, so today what I'm gonna do is um, tell you a three-part story. And it all revolves around this linkage between uh, in the environment, a trait, and a gene, okay? So the first part of the story, what I wanna do is focus on talking about a trait and its variation, and the link between that variation and environmental variation. In particular, the role of natural selection in producing that variation. Next, what I'll do is I'll take you from the uh, field and we'll go into the lab where I'll tell you about our work trying to identify the genes and, and mutations in those genes that give rise to this variation in the trait and how those genes work through development to produce that variation. And once we have all these connections made, here's where I think things get really fun. We have a much more complete picture of the evolutionary process and we can go back out into the wild and ask how these traits evolved in nature. So the trait I'm going to talk about is pigmentation. And the reason um, pigmentation is an exciting trait is because it's involved in a number of biological processes. It's the primary way in which organisms interact with their environment. So I just wanted to give you some examples of how color can be important. So it can be important for um, reproduction. So um, flowers, for example, the color attracts different pollinators, which of course is how plants have sex. Um, there's the canonical example of the peacock's tail and the bright male flashy tail attracting females. It can be important um, not only as an attractant, but as a deterrent. So um, this is a poison arrow dart frog that produces poison in its skin, and the bright coloration is used to warn predators of its toxicity. And of course, no good biological story would be complete without some cheaters. So we have these um, species that are mimics. They themselves aren't toxic, but they have the color pattern of toxic individuals. So they get the benefit of warding off predators, but without the cost of producing toxins. But probably the most common way that color is used in the biological world is through crypsis, that is camouflage. And this is what I'm gonna talk about today. Okay, so we study coloration not only because it's relevant for ecology, but the other reason we study pigmentation is because we know a lot about the genetics. There's at least a century's worth of work by geneticists who have been working on laboratory colonies of mice. So they have a colony of, mi of mice, and every once in a while you'll get a mutant phenotype that comes up. And as that mutant comes up, you can map and clone the genes uh, that are responsible for that. And based on that work, we have this incredible list. Again, I don't expect you to read or memorize. You won't be tested on this. But just appreciate that we know a lot of genes that if you mutate that gene, you're going to have an effect on color. So we know something about the ecological relevance of color, and we know something about the genetics. Now, if we were interested in connecting 
phenotypic variation or color variation and the genetics, one could argue why not study laboratory mice? Well, in the wild, they don't actually vary that much in color, right? They're usually brown, they live in our houses. Um, some argue they don't have much of an ecology. So instead, um, we study a close relative of um, house mice shown here in their slightly flattened form. Um, so, <laughs> so these are classic um, museum uh, preparations, and this gives me a little in to encourage all of you to come visit the Museum of Comparative Zoology. It's sort of a hidden gem here on campus. Uh, there's a public exhibit that you're welcome to um, come and attend, and maybe in, even in some of your classes, you'll use the collection um, as well. So you could come see some of these flattened mice in person if you get excited about this. Okay. But um, the main point of this slide is to tell you, or to show you how, color, how much color varies in these mice. So these mice are in the genus Paramiscus. They're often called deer mice. And you can see on this um, part of the slide, they vary in overall dorsal color. So this is how pigments are distributed on individual hairs on their back. But they also um, vary in the distribution of pigments across their body or color pattern. Now that list of candidate genes that I showed you earlier is largely responsible for this type of variation. And we actually know very little about how patterns are formed. Okay? So by studying these mice, we have um, this opportunity to learn something about color patterns as well. So you'll, you may notice that these pictures are attributed to somebody named Sumner back in the 1920s. So here's a picture of um, Sumner. This is Francis Sumner. He was a classic natural historian, a museum biologist, who spent most of his career driving around the US, trapping mice, and describing variation in them. And variation by coat color variation, or behavioral variation, um, et cetera. And this is actually the outfit that he wore when he was driving around um, uh, the US. <laughs> Field biologists don't dress like this anymore, um, but nonetheless, you can see it's this sort of dapper sunshade and a nice tie, et cetera. His favorite subject of study, his favorite species of mouse, and arguably mine as well, um, is this one, Paramiscus polyanotis. And it's called the old field mouse. And it's called the old field mouse because it occupies these overgrown agricultural fields throughout much of its range in the southeastern US. So here what you're looking at right is Florida, uh, Georgia, uh, Alabama, South Carolina. Um, and throughout much of its range, it looks like to you guys, probably a typical mouse, right? It's got a dark brown coat, a light colored gray belly, and it's got a nice stripe on its tail. But what's particularly relevant to us about these mice is that they've recently colonized these uh, sandy beach islands here on the Gulf Coast of Florida, as well as um, these uh, coasts out here on the Atlantic Coast. Um, just to give you some context, if you guys have been watching the news, this is about where um, Hurricane Isaac is, right about here. Okay. So um, the first part of my talk, I'm going to focus on um, just one of these populations. So importantly, each one of these numbers represents a uh, different subspecies. They all belong to the same species. Okay? So I'm going to talk about one of these, um, this population number three. And these subspecies are referred to um, as beach mice um, because these mice actually live on the beaches. So here's one of our field sites. Um, if anybody wants to get some field experience, maybe in February when it's pretty dismal in Cambridge, you can come out here. I think this is one of our undergraduates maybe taking a break, um, <laughs> caught on camera. Um, so you can notice right away, compared to the um, dark loamy soils and, and uh, heavily vegetated habitat of the mainland mice, these beach mice have very different habitat. And it differs in two ways. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that there's um, the so substrate is a different color, right? How many of you guys have been down to the Gulf Coast of Florida? All right. So this is like, this is a big um, spring break spot, um, in part because it really does have these beautiful white sand beaches. And when you walk through these dunes, it's like walking on hills of granulated sugar. Okay, so these are beautiful white sands. The second thing you'll notice is that there's much less vegetative cover. So these mice experience actually pretty high levels of predation. Um, their primary predators are thought to be owls, herons, hawks, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. So it's not surprising then when we go out to these beautiful beaches in February that um, the mice that we catch actually look quite different. So here's a picture of one, yes, it's okay to say aww. Um, I should mention this is not to scale. Um, <laughs> wouldn't that be cool? These mice are about the same size, and they're about the size of a ping pong ball when they're sort of hunched over. So they're, 
I know, they're very cute. Okay, you can see just by this picture um, how different they are in their color and pattern. So these guys lack pigment on their nose, on their flanks, and on their tails. Okay? The other thing I need to mention to you about the system is that um, those beaches that the, they live on, um, we actually know something about their geological history. They're only a few thousand years old, so it's quite possible that this difference in color has evolved in just a few thousand years. Okay. So then, I know you guys are all thinking, well, this makes perfect sense, right? These are white mice because they live on white sands, and that affords them some protection from aerial predators that are looking around trying to look for prey. But of course, we're scientists, and we can't just tell stories. We actually want to prove this is true. So um, the first thing we wanted to do was um, empirically demonstrate that color matters for survival, okay? to do an experiment that shows this is true. The second thing we wanted to do was estimate the strength of selection. That is, oh, perfect. Um, that is, um, understand how much it matters for their survival, this camouflaging color. And the third thing we wanted to do was ask who's doing the selecting? Who's actually um, taking these mice and uh, where the color matters to them? Okay. So the first part I'm going to tell you about is trying to implicate a role for natural selection in this variation in color in um, this one species of mouse. So we wanted to do an experiment. So how do we prove that color has evolved uh, due to camouflage? Well, my ideal experiment would be to, let's say, capture 100 beach mice, 100 mainland mice, give them all little tags, and then release maybe 50 light and dark mice in dark habitat, and release 50 light and dark mice in light habitat, come back in a month and see who survived. And we'd predict the light mice would survive better in light habitat, and the dark mice would survive better in dark habitat. Well, for a variety of reasons, they don't like us catching all those mice and moving them around, and et cetera, et cetera. So we did um, the next best thing. And in some sense, I would argue, it's an even better experiment. So instead of using live mice, we made mice. So what you're looking at here is Sasha Benieri, who's a postdoc in my lab. And she, um, along with um, an undergraduate, uh, Joanna Larson, made hundreds of um, model mice that look just like in the shape and form and size, et cetera, um, of, as our real mice. And she painted half of them dark and half of them light. So the upside of this experiment, right, is there is no other differences in these mice besides color, okay? Whereas if we use real mice, they could be different in their activity patterns or their smell or their escape behavior. So here we're really focusing just on color. The downside of this experiment is we didn't know if it was gonna work, right? It took me two years to convince anybody to do this experiment. Could we fool predators into going after a thing that looked like a mouse, but didn't act like a mouse or smell like a mouse? Well, I wouldn't be telling you about this experiment if it didn't work, right? <laughs> so what Joanna and uh, uh, our undergraduate and uh, Sasha did is they released equal numbers of light and dark mice in light and dark habitat, and they did this in the evening, came back in the morning, and see who got eaten. So here's an example of a predation event. Here's a dark mouse uh, on light habitat. And you can see it's missing sort of its left ear and it's got a big gouge out of their back. And what's cool about this is not only we know it's a predation event, but we know something about the predator because there's no footprints around. And this is a nice bill imprint. So this is um, an avian predation event. So some bird came along and took a bite out of this guy. Okay. So they did this experiment um, over hundreds, if not thousands, of model nights, so um, the number of models out per night. And here are the results. So let's focus um, first on this top panel, or let's focus on the light mice here, the light habitat. So here is a light mouse, here's a dark mouse. And what these numbers are telling us is um, something about their predation rate. So you can see um, the predation rate for cryptic mice, the ones that match their habitat, is lower than those that are mismatched. What's even cooler is that you see the same thing on dark habitat. That is, it's almost perfectly symmetrical. These guys survive. It's just as good to be a dark mouse on dark habitat as it is to be a light mouse on light habitat, or just as bad to be mismatched on both. And we can actually use these data to estimate how much it matters. I'm just going to um, tell you that it matters a lot. If you match your habitat, you have about a 50% increase in survival compared to if you don't match your habitat. And I told you we can also tell something about the predators, and about half the predation events came from owls, herons, and hawks, and the other half came from mammalian carnivores like foxes and coyotes. Okay. 
So what I hope to do is convince you that natural selection is a driver of this color difference between these two mice. Next, what I want to do is now take you from the field into the lab and tell you something about the genetic basis of these traits. So I don't want you to get caught up in the details, but I just want to give you a sense of how we do this experiment. So what we can do is take dark mice and light mice from the field, bring them into the lab in controlled environmental conditions, so everything else is uh, the same. Now here, um, they have different genomes. So this guy has, let's say, a dark genome. This one has a light genome. So these um, represent just different chromosomes. We can cross these guys, so put them in a cage together. They make offspring. Take those offspring, and all those offspring are going to have one chromo dark chromosome, one light chromosome. Then we take those hybrids, and we cross them together. And now what happens is their genome starts to get shuffled up, and they have chromosomes that look much more like this. So for each of those mice, that second generation hybrid, we use molecular markers across the genome to determine how their chromosomes look, which regions are light regions and which ones are dark regions, and then we measure their coat color pattern. And all we do is do a simple statistical analysis to ask which regions of the genome might harbor genes that contribute to the differences between the parents. And our ultimate goal is to find the genes and the mutations in those genes that uh, contribute to these color differences. Okay? Okay. So summarizing years worth of work in one slide. Um, so what you're looking at here, are each of these represents a different chromosome. Each of these little tick marks represents a different marker that's different between light and dark mice. But the main point is that we found three regions of the genome indicated by these arrows. Um, the size of the arrows indicate how much this region matters for color. So there are three regions of the genome that harbor a gene or genes that contribute to color differences. So I want to tell you about one of these regions. I'm going to tell you about this one here, which harbors uh, a gene called the melanocortin-1 receptor. Okay. So this is the melanocortin-1 receptor. It looks like a typical um, protein. It's a protein that's found in the membrane of cells, and its job is to take information from the outside of the cell and translate it into the inside of the cell. So each one of these little circles represents an amino acid, and I've colored the amino acids um, dark or light if they are known to cause a change in the receptor uh, function that leads to a change in color. So this gene has long been known to be a pigmentation gene. It comes from that list that I showed you in the beginning of the talk. Um, and people have found mutations in this gene that uh, affect the uh, receptor function and affect coloration. So what we decided to do was sequence now a mainland mouse and a beach mouse and ask are there any differences. And we found a difference, which is highlighted here in red. And it turned out there's an arginine to cysteine change at this one particular base pair. So there was one nucleotide difference and that meant there's one amino acid uh, difference, and it's a charge-changing difference, uh, which likely affects the um, receptor's function, okay? So we got super excited. Here we have a light, elite, a light uh, version of this receptor, a dark version. They differ by one site, so it looks like it's a big change, and it's perfectly correlated. We could have made, we could have found the mutation, but of course this is just a correlation. You needed to prove that this mutation actually changed the receptor function in the direction we expected to lead to light mice. So how did we do that experiment? So um, first let me tell you a little bit more about what melanocortin um, one receptor does. So here you're looking at a melanocyte. This is the cells in our body that produce pigments. In mammals, we have two types of pigments, dark brown to black, or uh, pheomelanin, which is blonde to red, so you can look at your hair unless you dye it, um, and determine what type of pigment you have. Okay? So melanocortin-1 receptor is really the switch on, these, on this cell that determines what type of pigment it's going to produce. When it's turned on and it's activated, it produces, through cyclic AMP, high levels of cyclic AMP, which produce dark pigment. When the receptor is turned down, there's less intracellular cyclic AMP, and you get light pigment. So right away, this gave us a prediction. If this mutation affects this receptor um, and produces light-colored mice, we may predict that there's reduced receptor activity. And in particular, it could be that this mutation in M2NR affects the way the gene that turns it on uh, binds. Okay, so how do we do this experiment? We took those two sequences that differed by just one nucleotide change, put them in an expression vector, put that into cells, produced the proteins, again, differing just by one amino acid, and asked do they behave differently. Okay. In particular, in these cells, what we can do is add this protein, which is alpha-MSH, 
And as a proxy for receptor activity, we measured how much cyclopatia would be with food. Okay? So here you go. We're adding more and more. So this is just the dark allele or the allele from the dark mouse. <coughs> we add more and more alpha MSH. And here's the activity of the receptor. And you can see it sort of goes up as you add more and more the activator and then plateaus on. A typical response for the receptor. We did the exact same experiment with the receptor that differs by that one amino acid. And we found that no matter how much alpha MSH you add, there's always a low level of cyclopatia. Uh, uh, this is perfectly consistent with the idea that this, this single mutation causes a reduction in the receptor function, which causes the mice to be lighter, which causes them to survive better in the wild. So here we've made a link between a single DNA-based pair chain and fitness in the wild. And this is one of the first examples where we've been able to make this connection between environment and machines. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's all this one gene and this one mutation. Remember, there are three regions. The other two genes we've identified are a gene that turns off them as a one r And when this is overexpressed, and a gene that acts upstream is overexpressed, it also contributes to light color. Okay. So now I've told you a little bit about um, the genetic basis and how changes in that gene produce the trait. So now we have a much more complete picture of how this process works. Now we can go back out into the wild and ask, how did this evolve in nature? So I just want to give you one example of this type of study. So here's um, me and my um, postdoc, Vera Dominguez. We went back out into the field again in February. You guys will appreciate this when it comes to February. Um, here, um, catching mice. Um, this is a mouse that we just weighed with a pistola, kind of dangling by its tail, which it doesn't seem to mind. And we're recording a uh, coat color um, pattern in this particular mouse. So for each of these mice, we weigh them, we take standard measurements, we um, document their coat color pattern, and we take a little snippet of DNA from its tail. And then the best part, after we ear tag it, is we release it back into the wild. Okay. So for all of these mice that we've gone back now to the wild, we have DNA data, and we have information about their color pattern. So just by way of reminder, everything I've told you about so far was this um, subspecies here, Santa Rosa Island Beach Mouse. But there are actually five subspecies on the Gulf Coast and three on the Atlantic Coast. Okay? So we went to all of these populations, collected data, and here's sort of a summary of what the mice look like. So um, each of these represent is a cartoon that represents the typical color pattern for these mice. And you can see that first there's a lot of variation among the subspecies, but all of these beach subspecies are much lighter than the main subspecies. But what's cool is um, these guys are actually um, quite different. So if you, for example, went for spring break down to the Gulf Coast and you grabbed a beach mouse and you brought it back to my office and said, I have a, um, a beach mouse that I got in the Gulf Coast, here it is. I could tell you probably with about 99% certainty which subspecies it was, just based on the color pattern. So these are really distinct. But if you went down to Florida and didn't tell me if you went to the Gulf Coast or the Atlantic Coast and you gave me a mouse, I probably wouldn't get it right, or I'd have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. And that's because these mice are phenotypically indistinguishable, these mice are indistinguishable, and these mice are indistinguishable. So even though these posts are separated by over 300 kilometers, the mice look very similar. So the question is, did they evolve independently on both posts? Or, and if so, did they use the same genetic changes? So to address this question, the first thing we did was we built a phylogeny. This is representing the relationships among the populations of mice. Think of it almost like a family tree. So what you can see here in the schematic is that the Atlantic Coast beach mice are all closely related. But they're in fact not that closely related to Gulf Coast subspecies. And what this tells us is that light coloration probably arose independently on the Atlantic Coast from the Gulf Coast. Okay. So these guys probably evolved from a dark ancestor from Central Florida and these guys from uh, a dark ancestor from the Panhandle. So here's the great thing about having discovered a mutation in the Gulf Coast beach mice. We can now ask, does that same mutation occur in these Atlantic Coast beach mice? Or did they use a different genetic mechanism? So we went back to our favorite gene, the melanocort 1 receptor. We sequenced the whole gene in hundreds of mice from the Atlantic Coast to ask if that arginine cysteine mutation was present. And we never found that particular mutation in hundreds of mice. So what this means is it's not the same mutation, even though the traits are the same, it's not the same mutation on the Atlantic 
Now you may be saying, well, you told us earlier there are lots of mutations in this gene that affect color. So maybe it's another mutation in this gene. And again, now we went back and sequenced um, the whole gene, not just looking at this um, particular base, and didn't find any new mutations in the gene that cause light coloration. So this means that while melanocortin receptor makes uh, beach mice lighter on the Gulf Coast, it doesn't contribute to the light color on the Atlantic Coast, even though their phenotypes are indistinguishable. So this is what we call convergent evolution. So what I've done so far is told you that we can make these connections between environment phenotype um, through and down to genotype, or environment traits and genes. Um, and what I've told you is a story about within a single species, how there can be different genetic solutions to this common ecological problem of wanting to be a light mouse living on light soil. But I want to end by telling you a story where sometimes in really different uh, organisms, you can have the same genetic basis. So let's think about mammals. So if you take a mouse, what's a mammal that's most different from a mouse? Elephant? Close enough, because you're never going to guess. Whales, whales are good. Somebody say T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> mammals, mammals. You'll learn this, you'll learn this. <laughs> OK, so elephant is a great guess, because I'm going to tell you about this guy here. Oh, <laughs> I understand why you did that for beach mice, but OK. So what you're looking at here is a mammoth. And about um, six years ago, this, this will seem so old-fashioned to you guys, but it was a big challenge to sequence an entire gene in an extinct organism. You know, these days we're sequencing entire genomes of extinct organisms, but just six years ago, one complete gene was a big challenge. So a group in Germany decided to sequence, to take up this challenge and sequence a gene in mammoths. And they chose mammoths because mammoths are um, frozen in permafrost about 15,000 years ago, um, and this was in Siberia. And this is like keeping the DNA in a giant freezer, right? This is great. This is your best quality DNA that you're going to get from a specimen that's thousands of years old. And so th now they knew their organism, and the next question is, well, what gene were they going to choose? Well, they decided to choose the melanocortin 1 receptor, in part because it's a small gene that's only about a thousand base pairs, but also it could tell them something about color. So they sequenced um, DNA, now this is extracted from bones, uh, from three different specimens caught, caught uh, excavated from uh, one site, and they found a uh, mutation. Guess what mutation it was? Okay. Arginine to cysteine at position 65. The exact same mutation that we found in beach mice. So what's the implication of this? That mammoths, sorry, I'm not very good at Photoshop, but mammoths, like beach mice, um, may have been polymorphic in color. Why they may have been polymorphic is completely unclear. When this hit the press, the headlines read, blonde mammoths have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so at least some people thought that this was be involved in sexual selection, but, but who knows? It's a, it's a hard question to say. So in this particular case, what we're showing is that very different mammals, in this case, can use the same changes, in, in this case, the same mutation, uh, to achieve differences in their traits. And the melanocortin receptor, as I've sort of intimated, isn't just involved in beach mouse color um, and mammoth color, but in fact, different mutations in the same gene contribute to coloration in lizards. So I don't know how many of you have been out to white sands in New Mexico. Uh, but this beautiful white sand dunes in the middle of New Mexico, where this, this is the same species of lizard, uh, the lizards look like this, for very similar reasons to, as I explained with beach mice. A different mutation in melanocortin receptor is responsible for these differences. Cows, this is a, a melanocortin 1 variant. How many of you guys have a Labrador retriever? Yep, there's a couple of you. Black labs, golden labs, and melanocortin 1 receptor. And even more recently, we've learned, as people have been sequencing the Neanderthal genome, that the melanocortin 1 receptor has variants in uh, its melanocortin, that the melanocortin 1 receptor has mutations, that when you do those pharmacological assays that I showed you before, those curve, those dosage response curves, also likely cause at least a small proportion of Neanderthals to be resonated as well. Okay.
So today what I've done is try to give you an example of connecting environmental variation, trait variation, and genetic variation. And what I want to sort of impress on you is that this is a very exciting time in biology where we can make these connections, where we can do field work and understand the nitty gritty molecular details of how the variation is set in the field comes to be. But I want to put this in some context. So, you know, it's almost like every time, I'm sure you guys are going to go to lots of lectures where people say, this is the most exciting time in physics. This is the most exciting time. But I want to give you a sense, of, at least for biology, why I think this is the exciting time. And it helps, I think, to put this in the context of milestones. And we talked about some of these. So we talked about in 1859, Darwin published on the origin of species. 50 years later, Mendel's laws of inheritance, genetics, was discovered. Almost exactly 50 years later uh, was the discovery of DNA. About 50 years later, we're really getting to the point where we can sequence whole genomes. Now, of course, we've been able to sequence the whole genome of, of stuff before now. But now is a point where we're not just being able to sequence one human and one mouse and one rat. But instead, we're talking about sequencing all humans. Maybe not all mice and rats. but. Um, nonetheless, the price of genome sequencing is plummeting, okay? So this, okay, the first caveat to this slide is this was um, from 2009. So this is no longer up to date, but nonetheless it makes the point. So here this paper was published touting being able to produce a genome, a human genome, for about $4,000. But here's what's important, look, look at this. In, in 2003, not that long ago, the cost of sequencing a human genome was estimated at $300 million. That was down to $1 million in 2007 and 60000 last year. So just imagine where the field is going. Okay? So what does this mean to your everyday life? Okay? This is, can mean lots of things, but I think we're at this exciting point where genomics, not only can we sequence these uh, genomes, but they're allowing us to make links between gene traits and environment. And this is not just important to people who study beach mice. But I imagine, much to my dismay, not all of you are going to have a career in beach mouse genetics. Um, but I think it's actually um, revolutionizing sort of our everyday life. So I'm just going to give you a few um, examples. The first thing is, um, when we think about uh, uh, conservation and biodiversity, I gave you an example here of how we study how organisms adapt to their environment in the past. But by doing so, this gives us some power to predict how organisms will adapt to future environmental change. And as you all know, the environment is changing at a rate that's um, rapid, unlike anything we've seen in history. And so the ability to predict how organisms may or may not change has big implications uh, for conservation. It's also important for agriculture. And what I mean by this is feeding people on the planet. That is, um, uh, the ability to link gene traits and environment for um, agriculturally important organisms is also um, a, a big uh, endeavor, which we're making much progress in in recent years. So generating plants, for example, that are resistant to pest disease and climate. So identifying the genes that are important for these traits, understanding how they interact with the environment, allows us um, to better uh, feed the plant. And of course, there's um, medicine. So here I've been telling you a story about identifying genes that are beneficial to um, organisms. Well, the exact same approaches that I've been talking about related to beach mice can be applied to humans, but looking for genes that are harmful, so disease genes. And so we can identify disease genes, understand what the uh, traits are they affect, how that interacts with the environment, and this gives us an opportunity uh, to identify therapeutic targets. And of course, um, there's this uh, idea which I'm sure you guys are all going to hear more and more about is this idea about personalized medicine. Sequencing each of our genomes allows us um, not only to um, contribute to uh, the information necessary to identify disease genes, but different therapies are going to be different depending on your genetic or genomic background. Okay? So personalized medicine is another big, um, important uh, thing that's um, being discussed a lot, both in terms of the science, but also in terms of the ethical so with that, I want to thank um, folks in my lab here at the Mousius, um, including many undergraduates. So that's one of the great things about um, Harvard for you guys is the opportunity to um, get into research labs with your hands um, dirty. Um, it's great for us. Um, we get a lot of um, 
of not only benefit from you guys helping us, but a lot of enjoyment from interacting with undergraduates. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. There, there are microphones you can come up to to uh, ask your questions, so it'll be on tape for the uh, people in the back. So you talked about how like white mice survive better on white sand, et cetera. Are there organisms that actually like say like say, if there's a brown mouse on white sand, do they actually like move to like say like like brown soil? Like, are there organisms that do that? Yeah. So the question is, are they self-aware and do they yeah. know that they're a yeah. white mouse? They should be on white soil. Um, so that's that's yeah. Simple. So in the case of mice, we don't think that that's the case. Um, are there organisms that do this? Um, certainly, to some extent. Um, so, for example, let me give you an example um, with mice. This is a little bit um, tangential, but it gets, gets to this point somewhat. Um, that is, we know when we go out in the field, when we plan our, our field trips in February, we um, look at when there's going to be a full moon, and we never go out on nights where there's a full moon. And that's because we, our trapping success will be dismal. And it's because it's brighter outside, the mice feel more, you know, I'm sort of thinking it like a mouse, but feel more exposed. And they um, venture out um, to our traps much less frequently. So that's an example, in, in some sense, of when there's a difference in the environment, they know not to come out onto the white soil. But there are um, plenty of organisms that um, do this. How they do it, how they know, um, is completely unknown. Right, thanks. It's a great question. Perfect. Is your research considered the complications posed by epigenetics? Oh, good question. So um, one of the, um, I, I get that question fairly frequently, in part because um, one of the genes that we've implicated that I didn't talk about is a gene called the GUDI, and that's one of the first, to me, in my mind, one of the first cases that where it's been robustly shown that it's under epigenetic control. Um, in this case, um, everything that we've seen so far in the lab can be explained by traditional Mendelian genetics, so there's really not a need to invoke epigenetics. That being said, we haven't, because of that, we haven't gone and tested for a role of epigenetics. But this is a topic that we talk about um, in LS1B. I think it's a big topic, and it has um, especially interesting uh, sort of uh, uh, ramifications for evolutionary thinking, uh, because Epigenetics, in some sense, is much more consistent with a Lamarckian view of how things change than a Darwinian view. But that being said, I think they're completely consistent with each other. Right? So it doesn't epigenetics does not uh, discount or disprove evolution. Did you find any evidence for selection and mating with these mice? Ooh, good question. So do the mice do light mice like other light mice? And this sort of is, is complementary to the are they self-aware question. So if you're a light mouse living on light soil and you want to have light baby mice, you should probably mate with another light mouse, right? Um, we have no evidence um, for mate choice. We've done a big experiment to look for this, um, which we have high power, and we haven't found any evidence um, for it yet. Um, maybe not surprisingly, because mice tend to be very olfactory driven. Um, there are many great uh, cases where mate choice is completely dependent on color. Um, for example, in butterflies and so forth, but no, apparently not in these things. Great question. Yeah. When mate choice is dependent on color, do, um, those, does that mate choice sort of um, continue the, the choice that they're, uh, is it genetic? Like, right? mm -hmm. the parents make the same choice that the children they make and then continue to slash like mate? It certainly can be. And so the example that jumps to mind is in uh, California butterflies, which are um, a tropical form of butterfly. They're involved in mimicry. So you'll have in any one area, maybe let's say eight species, distinct species, but they all look identical. You go 100 yards up the Amazon, same eight species, but they all have a new color pattern. And that's sort of the predators in the area know that that's associated with this toxic butterfly. But in that case, what they've shown is that not only is mate choice, uh, locally sort of controlled by genetics. Um, so there's a genetic component. The guys over here prefer their color pattern, and the guys over here prefer their color pattern, and they've shown that it's not learned, it's genetic. But that there's actually co-inheritance 
of the genes controlling preference with the genes controlling color pattern. And that makes sense because if you're on different chromosomes, then the, your offspring may inherit one color pattern but prefer another color pattern, right? Which is no good if you want to maintain that color pattern for mimicry reasons, um, which is just a, a astounding result, right? It all makes sense, but recently they've shown this with uh, genetics and molecular markers. So I'm hoping that the offspring pick mates that look like their parents. Um, that have the same preference that um, their parents had, if that's, you know, because that's, but also whatever, um, Yes, I mean, it's essentially, so whatever uh, alleles they get from their parents, the preference and um, the color locus, locus um, are co-inherited. Um, and that does mean that they prefer, in some sense, it's almost easier to think that they prefer something that looks like themselves, which will be like. Yes? Do you consider the more central Florida Floridian mouse to be the, the source or the pre-mutated um, mouse? Yes. Yeah, so, um, that's a great question. That's, um, we consider it the ancestral species in part because we know it's been there for much longer. I mentioned very briefly that the islands are very young, just a few thousand years old, and we know the mites have been around for much longer than that. So our hypothesis, and that we've tested using genetic data, is that they were all dark mice on the mainland. They've colonized the beaches over time, where on the beach, um, they may, they're sort of waiting around for a light mutation, but that individual that has that mutation is going to benefit and pass on its genes. Uh, to the next generation. And I'm giving you a simplified version. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, but we've been able now with genomic techniques to sort of get a sense of the history of the mice, how long they've been on the island, and the history of the particular alleles connected to these pigmentations. Yes? Approximately half the plate section A trash the evolutionary change occurring in population Okay, so um, we can estimate this. I mean, so in the case of a new mutation, so the mutation doesn't exist already, it's dependent on the mutation rate, the number of uh, sites that possibly can change color in the genome, and then the number of individuals or the number of chromosomes in the population. So you could do a back of the envelope calculation of the approximate time it would take to get a particular mutation. The hard part is we know something about mutation rate, we can estimate something about the number of individuals, what is harder to estimate is how many mutations have the potential to make a mouse lighter. But we can, we can guesstimate, but that's the, the, the hard part. Is there a selection for allowing certain parts of the chromosome to undergo more mutations? In other words, does that area of the chromosome uh, is it able to change more quickly than others that might be less exposed? And does that happen from arranging of the chromosome? That's a fantastic question, and I will see you in my evolutionary biology class where we talk about this in detail um, in a couple of years. Um, so, after LS1B. Um, so, the question is, is there selection for increasing mutation rate? And this has actually been a very controversial topic. There's still not complete agreement. Of what I always say is that certainly there's variation among, if you go take a chromosome and you estimate mutation rate along the chromosome, there's big variation in mutation rate, okay? Um, I don't think we have any solid evidence that suggests that there's selection for increased mutation rate, and certainly not on particular parts of the chromosome. And the thing you have to be very careful about is that it's very easy to think, okay, these mice get to the beaches and they know they need to get lighter, they increase their mutation rate, so, so a light mouse will appear sooner. And that, of course, doesn't happen. But if they're exposed to a wide variety of environments, can there be selection for ones whose progeny can like, spread to a different greater area of the greater rate? Okay, so there's been great experiments that have been done um, in microbes, where you can sort of, in the lab, change the environment a lot, where you think having a high mutation rate would benef be beneficial for the reasons you explained. And um, there's some evidence that maybe the mutation rate is higher, it's, in my opinion, still quite weak. I think it's a really interesting possibility in that case. Now the question is, does that actually happen in nature? And, and the other thing to consider is there's always going to be a balance between um, the benefits of having, you know, mutations in general are going to be bad, right, deleterious. So you can't have too many because you're going to not do well. Um, but you want to have enough so that once in a while you have a beneficial one. Right. So I think that's a, a great question, um, and I think the jury's still out. I don't think there's good evidence.
Yeah. Uh, is there any relationship between the different colors of mice and um, cephalopods' change of color? And oh, the cephalopods' ability to change color, which is so cool. These guys, um, yes, in some sense. Um, so these guys have um, certainly they share genes, right? That was one of the big discoveries of being able to sequence the genome of, uh, uh, let's say, vertebrates. Right? We all pretty much have the same set of genes. Um, even down to flies and cephalopods and so forth. Um, some of the machinery is the same, so the way they produce pigments, but there's the big difference is that in a mammal, in, in cephalopods, which is not my area of expertise, but from what I understand, the pigment granules that are produced, like the circles of eumelanin and pheomelanin I showed you, um, can be moved in and out of the cell. So there's this transport mechanism based on actin and so forth that moves those pigments out, and that's how they can change color. Um, in mammals, they're not able to do that. Um, and so those, they, they sort of get deposited on hairs in their, in their face. Um, yeah, but the, there are some beautiful studies um, done in Woods Hole, which is just an hour and a half away, a very lovely place to go, um, on, on some of these cephalopod uh, experiments. So just, you know, you take one of these squid, you put it on a checkerboard, and it turns checkered. Absolutely amazing. They're just not as cute as me. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is a great question. This is something that all of you should keep in mind. When you read papers or you hear seminars, what you hear is all the stuff that worked. And what you don't hear is all the stuff that didn't work. And this is something that I find, um, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I went to the lab, I did my first experiment, and it didn't work. And I just thought, I am a failure. I'm never going to be a scientist. I can't do experiments. You know, for some, some cases, we've tried for years, you know, and I sort of mentioned at one point, even make, identifying these three mutations probably took us about eight years, right? Um, so there were lots of things that went wrong. Um, if, one thing is if you do field work, everything and anything will go wrong, okay? So that's part of um, the joy of being in the field. Um, trying to think of a good example. So here's, here's one example. It's not something that really went wrong, but um, one, we knew when we started this experiment that the melanocortin-1 receptor, I had actually studied it for my postdoc, and I had some primers lying in the lab, and one of my graduate students needed to just sequence some uh, DNA and do a comparison uh, in these mice for completely different reasons. So she sequenced them to an R, and she came back a couple months later and said, you know, I noticed there was this mutation. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting, but, um, I, you know, it's probably not involved in this particular system, because before studying these mice, it had only been known to take an animal and make it all black or all white or all blonde, right? And here we have this more complex, nuanced pattern. So I had just disregarded MC1R. And it was two years later that when we did this big crossing experiment that we actually found MC1R. And, you know, I could have saved a lot of, I mean, we found other stuff too, and it was the right thing to do, but here's a case where I thought I knew more and discounted something um, just because, uh, you know, I just didn't think it was involved. I thought I knew everything. And of course, MC1R can do lots of interesting things. Yeah. Uh, you talked about some of the general applications of uh, the sequencing of the genome. Have you considered specific applications for MC1R? Not necessarily for MC1R per se, um, because that's just one part of the genome, and actually an incredibly small part of the genome. Um, but for these types of studies, I think that genomics is sort of, I mean, when I was a graduate student, we would PCR up a little pieces, a thousand base pairs at a time. You know, if you look at my thesis, it's totally pathetic compared to today's work, right? Where my students in my lab are sequencing whole genomes of hundreds of mice in different populations. And in that sense, I think um, it becomes much more of a, instead of looking at one particular gene, you sort of look at the role of the genome. And, you know, we do go in and look at particular genes and find particular mutations and test them in the same way, but here we're sort of taking a more blanketed um, approach. And it does, you know, in some ways, sequencing a genome doesn't cost that much and doesn't take that much time compared to doing, you know, these crosses, bringing the mice in, having them breed, you know, doing the next generation, et cetera, et cetera. But they're very complementary approaches. But I would say it has changed the face of evolutionary biology for sure. Um, 
and you know, certainly biology, and at such a rapid pace. You know, we're considering buying a machine that we put on our desktop, the bench top in our lab, that will sequence the genome. You know, wow, <laughs> amazing. You guys, I bet, you know, a proportion of you guys will sequence the genome in the next four years. Totally cool. And what you can do, so the one thing I'll say is that um, sequencing the genome, great. What you get is sort of the blueprint of the organism. The big challenge is understanding how all of those differences that you see in the genome, how they actually produce the organism, and what those differences mean to differences among organisms. That's the real challenge. The technical side of sequencing the genome has become quite straightforward, relatively speaking. But, you know, there's this great quote by, um, oh, I'm gonna forget his name. He's the sort of father of uh, C. elegans biology, um, Sidney Brenner who said um, just about 25 years ago, give me a genome and I can recreate the elegant. That is, you know, whether that was sort of um, optimism or naivete, I don't know, but um, it's how these, all these pieces, and there's maybe only 20,000 genes, how those all work together through development to produce an organism, that's a big challenge. And then think about the brain. How does the brain work, right? That's where it all gets complicated. Please. Did you happen to notice any behavioral differences between your mice that were that had a high tolerance and those individuals that are high tolerance or not? Um, so we haven't studied their be we study behavior in our lab. We haven't studied their behavior um, uh, in particular. There's some anecdotal sort of things that we've noticed. Beach mice are much more mellow. So you can hold a beach mouse in your hands. It'll eventually run away, but it pretty much hangs out. Mainland mouse is not going to hang out. And if anything, it's going to bite your, you hard. Um, but that's probably uh, more likely due to the beach mice being on these small islands. There's a lot of um, inbreeding because there's not that many mice on the islands. We know that can affect behavior. So it's, a hard, it's hard to sort of disentangle what's beneficial for a particular environment versus what's the consequence of their different demographic Okay. Thank you. I thank Professor Hoekstra for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I hope you noted that the next great revolution is still 46, 47 years away, so you can slow down and take a little time. Um, but thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of your opening days and we look forward to seeing you in all of our classes.